Golf Business Live. Here's Jay Karen and Don Ray. All right. Happy Friday, everybody who's tuning in. I'm Jay Karen, the CEO of the National Golf Course Owners Association here on Golf Business Live Friday edition. With me, the inimitable Don Ray, a member of our board of directors and owner of Augusta Ranch Golf Club in Mesa, Arizona. Um, and you know, before we get started, I just want to give a shout out to our, I'll call them our engineers, the show. You know, we got Thomas Smith, Taylor Wall, and Dave Barton kind of helping to craft this because, you know, that, that beautiful jazz music just reminds me of all the hard work that they do to pull this thing together. Although, guys, we may need to talk about that soundtrack and, and uh, change it up a little bit, uh, you know, to keep up with the kids because I'm not so sure that's millennial friendly music, but we'll, uh, we'll work on that. So, um, yeah, as a reminder to folks, uh, we have a Q&A module. And I will do my very best to keep up with the questions and answers. And we, uh, Don and I, will get to those as we can. And those that we cannot answer, uh, we will have the staff take them offline and follow up with either you directly or we'll post some answers on NGCOA's Accelerate platform for you to see. So, Don, how you doing, man? How, how's this week in Mesa, Arizona? <laughs> this week, well, the governor opened up all the restaurants on Monday. So we... Uh... We opened up on Monday, you know, the best we could. We were pressure washing every pressure of washing everything on Sunday and trying to get the staff back in line. You know, some had filed for unemployment, so it was a reaching out to people saying, "Do they want their jobs back? Do you want to come back?" I had to deal with some of that, which is interesting because whether it's the front of the house or the back of the house, let's talk about that. Different. I want to hear. Yes. I want to hear about that. You know, because if some folks are making possibly more money on unemployment than they were making as employed, what are you finding as far as? Uh, um, you know, the, the propensity to come back to work and make less money? Well, I think it's a fundamental of, uh, or a function of back of the house or front of the house. You know, front of the house, they make tips. There's some gratuities there. I think um, um, a lot of the, the sales staff that we have, the server staff that we had, you know, they've come back and they said they, they want to work, you know, and they, they want to see people and they want to be part of that. The back of the house, different story. You know, some of the the cooks out here, I would say in this market, they're probably going to make between 14 to maybe 16 bucks an hour, obviously less than the 40 something thousand a year that you'll make on unemployment, or at least 39 weeks of unemployment. And so that's been tough. Back of the house has been tough to fill right now. I think they understand that they're always a commodity that everybody wants. It's hard to get people in the back. There's, it's more of a transient position, it seems like, especially when you get into some of the you know, the dishwashers and, and the, the lower level cooks. I mean, I think the executive chefs and those, you know, they tend to stay around, take a lot of pride in their menu and their restaurant. But sometimes the lower chefs that are just prepping, you know, they can get a job at any time. And, and certainly with minimum wage so high, that makes it tough too. They can get a job at a fast food place and maybe make as much as my restaurant. So um, back of the house been very difficult to try to staff. Front of the house, everybody's come back and they're ready to see people, which is, which is nice because like we talked about last week, it's all about people. Talk to me about your restaurant setup. Like, wh what have you done to, uh, I assume you're still trying to enforce some social distancing, right? So how do you do that in a, in a dining room? Well, I was, I was pleased to see that our food and beverage manager was using my stick to make sure there was six foot distancing between the booths and stuff. And, you know, it's interesting. My son and I went to dinner on, son, on Tuesday night at a local sports bar. Um, every week we have, we have dinner together and talk about things. He's a 28, 28 year old millennial who's trying to figure this out. It works at Costco and has to wear a mask to work every day. Uh, but I was uh, really surprised by this restaurant where they had back-to-back -back booths all over the place and every booth was open. There certainly was an energy in the place of people excited to be out of their houses. Because obviously in Arizona, it's way different than it is even in Connecticut, who I had a call with this week, uh, which was interesting. But in Arizona, everybody wants to get back to life. But you know, it's, it's interesting when you see other restaurants not abiding by it at all. And yet in your own little restaurant at a golf course, which is always a tough road to hoe, um, you're trying to abide by the six foot rule in groups of 10 or less. And so uh, we certainly removed some tables. Uh, I moved a whole bunch of tables on, on Monday morning before we opened just to make sure we were there. Didn't really like the look of putting on a table saying this table's closed because of COVID or something like that. I'd rather just change the floor plan. So yeah, it looks more spacious, but it's not shouting out uh, we're doing this because COVID-19 is in the area, right? Or, or could be in the area. So I've tried to do that. I've, I've seen a lot of restaurants who put, you know, uh, signs on tables that say closed because of social distancing. I'd much rather would just remove those tables. So we did and, and put them out in maintenance or, you know, wherever we could put them in the cart barn. So that's, yeah, it's, 
you know, just at a meeting with the staff to make sure they understood the guidelines of what we were doing, change the way in which we deliver, you know, flatware and condiments and things like that so that we were abiding by what the governor said. We're just happy he opened us up. And did you see uh, an uptick in business at the, the food and beverage establishment? Yeah, you know, leading to the story of what I told you about the front of the house staff, I think people have been very generous with their tips. You know, I think they're understanding that our service staff has uh, been out of work for a while and, and the tips have been very small, um, especially because it was all on credit card. You know, they, a part of getting tips as a server is it's cash in hand that night. They get used to that money in their pocket and all of a sudden I went to no cash. And so certainly saw we were going to be closed on Tuesday and we actually decided against it. Um, I think going forward for the summer, we'll probably be closed a couple of days a week, but um, we elected to stay open the entire week. And I think it, it worked. A lot of people very grateful that we were open, wanted to be around other people. You know, people like spending time with other people. And out here, when it's 110 degrees, they feel like it's okay now. Now, certainly some people are still wearing masks, but um, yeah, certainly saw really good energy over there. People just grateful to be around, um, you know, the Scratch Pub and Grill where they like to hang out. Any, any trouble this week, you know, and any, uh, you know, how much, how much are you policing these days? Or do you feel like people are taking yeah. that, you know, personal responsibility seriously? You know, as we talked about, this is, you know, managing this is at the intersection of personal responsibility and business responsibility, yeah. kind of like, like drinking and over-serving and all of that. There's a line at which, you know, really the business can't be held too responsible when people are making idiotic decisions, but, you know, you also have to monitor for idiotic decisions. <laughs> Well, you know, there's been dram shop laws forever, right? So in a certain sense, you should police the amount of alcohol that you intake, but yet I'm responsible that you might go out there and kill somebody. So I think this is similar to that. I'm not saying it's exactly the same, but but, but when I see people over there, certainly this this week, people were over imbibing. I mean, there's no question. They were having fun with their friends for the first time in a long time, and, and, they, were, and they were going to uh, and take full advantage of that. So there, there were certainly a lot of drinking. We had to cut some people off, but that's what you do all the time. And, you know, certainly have the six foot stick out there just to remind people that, you know, um, cause it was funny the amount of people that would make a 10 person group. They might've showed up with four and these people showed up with four and these people showed up with four. Well, now they're just having a party and there's 12, mm -hmm. you know? So uh, yeah, I mean, it's, I know what you're saying. I'd love to think that it's a personal responsibility of everybody who shows up at a public place but at the end of the day, I have to enforce rules to make sure that everybody's safe, not just the two people having a good time. Yeah. Well, you know, this week we don't have a, a guest with us. We are we are the show because there's a lot to talk about. We got I got several several things on my mind and list. And, and why don't we uh, start off with talking about the back to golf program just briefly? I mean, it's been out there now for a couple of weeks, and you know, one from my observation. Um, one thing I've seen is uh, the positive press on this for the golf industry. You know, you, I, I, I always detect that the press, uh, the consumer media especially, has a kind of a schadenfreude about the golf industry, right? They, they, they like to find the negative and shine the light on that or create the negative and shine the light on that. And we all know there's a lot of reasons for that, you know, why they do that, I think. But, um, but now with, the, you know, with the, the launch of the Back to Golf program, it's got, it got a lot of media attention, positive articles in the New York Times, uh, Washington Post was, was showing that golf is the number one activity that people are okay with coming, you know, coming back to. We talked about that last week with Jaws. And, um, but uh, this, this past week, uh, the, led by the PGA of America, uh, the launch of these posters uh, that are available to any golf course that wants to post these on either on social media. Because one of the important parts about this, Don, as you, I'm sure you can attest to, is communicating to the people before they get there. What are the, what are the expectations what are the rules, uh, guidelines that are happening at Augusta Ranch or whatever golf course that you're running? And these posters are, are pretty great images to use in, um, in basically communicating some of the expectations. And I wanna show an example of what this looks like. Hang on a second. We'll show my screen. Let's give this Here a comes the moment of truth, Karen. Don't right. mess it up. Can you see that? Let's see. Hang on. All right, here we go. Hey, all right. There it is. Okay. Can you see that? I can. Fantastic. All right. So basically, these are the basics that you want to communicate to your golfer. Staying six feet apart. Staying home if you're not feeling well. Uh, you know, avoid the large gatherings on the first tee driving range. If in doubt, don't touch it. <laughs> I like that one. Uh, you know, always mark your ball clearly because obviously the risk here is if you're touching someone else's equipment or ball, then it's like 
that increases the risk, if you will. Wear facial covering when taking a lesson. Uh, avoid handshakes and high fives. Respect the game and all involved. And remember to wash your hands after playing. I'd say wash your hands before playing and wash your hands after playing probably are, are good things. But, you know, this is just one example of um, what a golf course can use to communicate this. You're not having to create your own images in this sense. And you can find these at the NGCOE website, ngcoe.org. Go to the COVID-19 center and you can download all these great materials. Um, and, you know, the, uh, we're launching a PSA pretty soon, a 30 second commercial with, uh, with a couple of uh, celebrities in the golf industry or in the golf, in the game of golf, kind of talking about taking responsibility when getting back to golf, doing the right thing. And, you know, this, there's just something in the DNA here about golf and how we call, you know, shots on ourselves and it's self-policing and all of that kind of stuff. I like, I like where this is going. And, uh, and so I know there's been, you know, mixed uh, reviews and mixed use of the operational playbook that comes along with this because there's a great detail in the operational playbook on back to golf and how to operate your course. Again, this was meant to be if the CDC was going to run your golf course, these are the things that they would do, right? And so um, it's being used uh, very positively by some with their, their government offices to encourage, you know, a, a friendly relationship and, and communicate the understanding that golf is good for this. Um, it's not necessarily meant to be the tool that everybody uses in their operation, but it's a great reference piece. So are you hearing anything out there in the field about back to golf? You know, Don, I know you're a PGA and NBC player. What are your thoughts right now on all this? Well, I will say the, um, I'm, I can watch the PSA right now on PGA.com or PGA.org. Um, that, that, like you said, Matt Kuchar's on there and, and, and a, several of the, uh, of the well-known golfers out there. So, I'm going to tease you a little bit. Go, go watch that as that gets out on all the different websites. The PJ certainly put it up. I, I guess my initial things on back to golf is this. Um, it's not perfect. Okay. It, it, depending on what state you're in, it might apply. It might not apply. You might be upset about, you know, of, of some of the restrictions, but you have to understand that those seven logos that are on that document has one showed this collective effort of collaboration that I don't think has ever happened. I know We Are Golf has done amazing things, but Jay, you and I both know there aren't enough people at We Are Golf on Capitol Hill for Golf Day, for National Golf Day. And hopefully that's going to change after all this is done. But at the end of the day, through a personal relationship that an independent board of director of the PGA of America had with the White House, with Fauci, uh, created this initial conversation with the CDC. And, and the PGA was like, listen, we just want to do right by golf. NGCOA obviously wants to do right by golf. And so now we've got this amazing document that the media is embracing saying, look at this is basically, it might be the first sport to not say this is what we're going to do, but to go to the CDC and say, what should we do? And let's follow with the three phases of what the White House is delivering. Once again, not going to be perfect, but I am so excited about this document coming out. I know it's not perfect. It's living and breathing. Heck, Ronnie sent me an email today to say, as an as an NGCOA board member, what is some of the input you'd like to see in this? Because it's an open, living and breathing document. It's and it's crowdsourcing in a sense so with all these boards of these seven organizations. So that's exciting. And I just, to me, for golf to have this perception, because only eight to ten percent of the population plays golf, to get mm -hmm. out to the public, not the people that are coming to play golf. Jay, you're exactly right. You read this document, go into the golf course, you know what you should expect. These are the basics of phase one, phase two, phase three responsibilities in a social distancing world. But golf coming out going, this is what we do. This first video talking about what we do as golfers. And then I think the subsequent videos talking about why you should play golf. I'm very excited about. And I, and I think I'm just, I applaud the seven associations. And if you're not a member of one of those seven, you should be. I mean, I know I love my membership of the NGCOA and the PJ of America because I'm getting so much information now as an operator, it's making me better, it's making my staff safer, and certainly my guests um, feel more comfortable when they come out here and play. But it's a great document, and, and, and to see the media rally around how we're the first in to say this is what we can do on behalf of the game, behalf of our nation, right? Yeah. I think it's impressive, and I think we can certainly leverage that for some great relationships legislatively and with the non-golfing consumer public. You bet. No, great commentary. We've got some questions that I'm going to get to here. Uh, one is a, one of them is a great segue into the next topic, but uh, someone's asking, where can I get the back to golf materials? Go to ngcoa.org and you will see the COVID-19 section. Click on that. And there's a whole section on getting back into golf, like the new and the, you know, the path forward. So check that out. It's all there. 
Uh, Lynn Bergman is asking, you know, federal assistance for unemployment ends July 31st. Hopefully back of the house workers will feel more safe by then. Term job in a very competitive job market will outweigh the instant pay increase for a few months. Do you feel when, do you feel when the federal assistance ends, workers will be more likely to work for the club again? Uh, that's a great segue. And I'm going to get to that portion of the HEROES Act. Um, you know, so the HEROES Act is kind of the next wave of legislation that uh, is that has been in the House and it's making its way to the Senate that would, um, you know, is a two trillion dollar package essentially to extend the relief effort here. And so, you know, there's some provisions here that are pretty solid for the golf industry, right? So, I mean, it extends the period of coverage on this uh, from June, on the, on the PPP thing. There's a, so there's the payroll protection program. It extends the coverage period until December 31st, which is great for those seasonal operators that, that have their high seasons in, in those times. It extends el eligibility for all nonprofits of all sizes. And this is important for the golf industry in that all of the organizations that work on behalf of golf at the national state level, and there are a lot of us out there, and a lot of them are C6 organizations, they now qualify for the funding as well as C7s. 501 C7s are uh, clubs. And so the 2000 clubs or whatever that are, that are organized under the C7 statute were not able to qualify for the PPP funding. According to the House bill, they would. Now, the caveat here, obviously, is that who knows if this will pass or not uh, and get to the president for signature and how much it will change uh, with this. Um, but um, uh, at least this bodes well because it was a bipartisan uh, bill in, in this sense. Uh, also, you know, they, yeah, I guess they learned a lot from the, from the first uh, you know, few months on this because the, there are a couple of interesting provisions that a carve out of that 25% of the existing funds uh, must be used for businesses with 10 or fewer employees. So, you know, there's kind of a safeguard in there because, you know, there's a rush to get the funding, right? And so some of the more uh, well-connected small businesses are going to rush to it. And, and those that have less than fewer than 10 employees, they may feel like, oh, I, I was slow footed here. I didn't know what to do. You know, I didn't have the resources to get this together. Well, they're, they're earmarking uh, some of the funds just for those small businesses and same thing for the nonprofits. Uh, some other things here also um, just to mention is that there's an elimination of the 75 25 rule on the use of loan proceeds, you know, cause there were a lot of folks saying, I don't think I can spend 75% of this on payroll. And if I don't, then part of the loan will not be forgivable anymore. And so they're, they're changing that in the bill, which gives owners and operators more flexibility to use the funding on things like mortgages and utilities and so forth, which is a big, big deal. Um, and, you know, some other great provisions, but the, to Lynn's question, I asked our director of advocacy to, to double check on this, but the unemployment supplement would be extended through Jan January 31st in this bill. And, you know, so that, that's going to beg the question of, all right, are these people going to stay out of the workforce to, uh, to keep the, the unemployment checks coming? Um, or, you know, are they, you know, when, are they going to want to get back to work and have the, the security of uh, their jobs again? Interesting question, right? And um, I think there's a hedge, you know, with the, with the unemployment going up, the hedge against these people that may say, you know what, I'm going to stay home for a while. The hedge against that is that now you've got more people looking for work, too. So if you need those full-time positions filled, you know, we may be in a higher unemployment market, right? And so if that's the case, then while you never want, you know, you, you hate to lose people and have to train new people, but you may find that people are knocking on your door to work at your facility if you've got a job opening. So, Don, you know, I know you've had some experience now with some folks coming back to work, but now if this gets extended through January 31st, which is a good thing, for, for businesses that are having trouble reopening and they can't staff their people, but are we gonna have this unintended consequence of folks staying at home and not getting back to work? Yeah, you know, this was a lot of information for me to read and, and, and to try to fully understand. And I'd love to know, you know, who knows how much of it's gonna get approved, I, but you're exactly right. It seems to answer a lot of questions. I mean, listen, I've watched a lot of le webinars about all of this and felt like I knew what, what I was going to do. And then all of a sudden we got the PPP money and now we're trying to do the math. Okay, eight weeks, we got the check on May 1, eight weeks. Well, I pay everybody every 15 days, not every two weeks. So my last payroll was going to, I wasn't going to get four payrolls out of it. I was only going to get three. So could I accrue that? All of a sudden these questions come. I almost felt like I was in school again where it made perfect sense when the teacher was explaining it. But then when I was doing the exam, it all left my mind. And I was like, what, what, what do you mean? I, where am I going to do this? So 
oh my goodness, I mean, if all this gets approved, it takes a lot of heat off operators who are trying to get their money forgiven, which by the way, this is a, if you, the PPP money was, was critical, I, I just applaud what they did because it is going to save Augusta Ranch. There is no question about that. This money is helping me get through this. And now by extending all of this, yeah. I mean, thank goodness for the private clubs out there that are going to get some of this money if it gets approved on the C6, C7 thing. Um, so now what, what will it do? Listen, don't forget on some of this PPP money, you can put some bonuses in there. I know that's certainly something Augusta Ranch is thinking that, okay, there was a government stimulus check that went to everybody. Can Augusta Ranch give a stimulus check to the employees of Augusta Ranch? Um, to Because I was thinking I needed this eight-week number. Now, if this gets extended to 24 weeks, well, it's going to be easy for me to spend 75% of the $223,000 that we got in the PPP loan. Um, but if it stays at eight weeks, certainly with the bonuses, I'm like, well, okay, that's a good option. So there's certainly so many things you can do. And if you're trying to do this in a vacuum or in a silo, you are going to miss. This is like back to school study group stuff here. Get with other operators who are doing what you're doing and who aren't like you. Like for me, I'm aligning myself with a lot of my buddies who work for big management companies. They seem to have a lot more information than I have that I'm scraping up on a, a brilliant website with the NGCOA. I mean, I love everything that's on there. That's where I'm sending people. Um, but well, uh, so, you yeah, know, this, um, yeah. I, I would, I just, again, I want to offer the caveat that this is just the house bill. A lot could change yeah. before this. So that's why I don't want to spend a lot of time on this and getting yeah. into answering questions that this is exactly what's going to happen. Uh, but what, you know, our team will do certainly will be to publish on accelerate, you know, we'll synthesize this for our members, just like we did with the first, you know, three waves of legislation and give as much guidance as we can on, on that. So, um, so yeah, so it's exciting to see that there could be you know extended relief for the beleaguered industry, and and you know I'm I'm really great to uh, grateful to see the the clubs are included here because you can see in the history of Washington's relationships with the golf industry, oh the clubs the privileged you know class they don't need any disaster relief funding from us we've seen it in the past but when you're able to articulate that this is not about the clubs it's about the people who work at the clubs that's what this is about you communicate that clearly. And the message is heard. And so we're, we're grateful. And the CMAA did an amazing job collecting, you know, tens of thousands of signatures, I think, on, on letters to Congress about this. And so, so excellent work by the club managers and others that, that uh, supported the, the C7 uh, change here that we we're going to cross our fingers and hope that, that we get. Um, yeah, yeah. Do you want to say something, Don? No, I, I mean, just to say, you know, it was just two months ago we were afraid golf wasn't going to get any PPP money, right? We're on the sin list. We're still on the sin list. It was scary times, Jay. And thanks for those seven organizations, especially you, grinding it out, getting We Are Golf to put that at the top of the list that, hey, let's not get messed up on this sin list thing because if they fall back to old habits, we're going to get removed just like what happened in the hurricane. So yeah. kudos to you that that's all in the rearview mirror now. We're happy that we got PPP money. But that almost didn't happen. This could have easily gone on uh, only, you know, courses or businesses on the sin list don't get the money, but you're right. You're right. Thank yeah. goodness for organizations like those seven logos that worked on behalf of the golf industry. Cause otherwise yeah. we could be talking about closing golf courses instead of right. uh, can we give bonuses? Right. Yeah. We have a question from Ann Pompa. I said last week, golf courses in the Finger Lakes region of New York received your back to golf email. All the courses were expecting to enter phase one today. However, governor Cuomo has not said anything about opening golf courses, allowing us to enter, the phase one that back to golf suggested all the courses are confused. The customers are calling constantly asking if they can use carts. If the shop is open, if we have no answers, I have heard many courses are going to do what they are going to do. Follow their own guidelines. Can you give us some insight? Well, you know, on this one, I hate to use the disclaimer on this, but it's no matter what is said in the back to golf document, you follow local law. If the governor has not cleared the way to do X, you can't do X. If, it's ambiguous, then you follow the most, cons I, I would always say follow the most conservative path forward um, on, as, as far as safety is concerned, uh, safety and security. So I hate to, I hate to be uh, elusive on that question, Anne, but um, you know, I guess you need clarity from the governor's office on the status of the golf industry being able to open up. But I would use the back to golf document as much as possible in communicating to Governor Cuomo, here, these are the practices that, and please endorse these, you know, and, uh, and this is what we'll follow as an industry. So that, that's my, my, uh, my suggestion right now is to use that as, as a tool. But, but I would not suggest, you know, courses go rogue against, uh, you know, 
you know, laws. Although what we saw in, in Massachusetts with one of our own members, you know, one of the one of the owners is saying, "Sorry, I'm opening." You know, the governor of Massachusetts was was dragging his heels on on announcing opening. You know, the businesses and she, the owner of the golf course, says, "I'm opening." Sorry, whether you like it or not, I'm opening. We got to survive. And there are some feeling that that pushed the governor to help finally, you know, open this up. One of the last three states to open. I mean, there was obviously peer pressure from 48, seven other states that opened, but to have an owner operator said, you know, so, so, you know, you got these counterbalances here, follow the law, follow the law. And someone's saying, nope, we're going to open. And some people think that that influenced the, 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 uh, the acceleration of opening golf. So anyway, and so, you know, if you have any other questions, please email Ronnie Miles on our staff at rmiles at ngcoa.org and maybe he can help you out with the, with the New York uh, situation. Um, so uh, someone's saying, please explain the 501c6 categories again. So all nonprofits in the United States are, are, are uh, classified under the IRS tax code of 501c. And the, the, the number after the C defines the kind of nonprofit you are. 501c3 is a charity. 501c6 is a trade association like us. 501c7 is a social club or social organization, which a lot of golf clubs are, un, are, are uh, like fraternity organizations, sororities, clubs are organized under C7s. And so um, that, that's, that's really the def, you know, and there are probably 25, 30 different sections of 501c. Uh, so you can easily uh, look you know, at the IRS website, to look under nonprofits, see the different categories and, and what have you. So, um, but the first wave of funding, you had to be a C3 uh, in order to receive uh, PPP funding, not the, uh, the, um, the other loan, the EIDL loan that, you know, any nonprofit could qualify for, but that's not the forgivable loan. That's why everybody really, really wanted uh, to, uh, to get the PPP loan. So, all right, so let's move on uh, real quick, Don. You know, uh, this week we sent out the first edition, and I'll get back to the questions, folks. Uh, we sent out our first edition of Golf Business Weekly. You know, we're moving Golf Business Magazine to a bi-monthly publication uh, and then digital only for the time being right now, but we launched Golf Business Weekly, and we started inviting opinion pieces. You know, something a lot of associations do is they, they try to play it safe, and they keep opinion out of the educational context, right? It's they a lot of sanitization going on oftentimes in some of the, the, the content that, that associations put out in every industry. But we've invited some opinion pieces now into the Golf Business Weekly because we know people love opinion and we know there's no shortage of them in the golf industry. So the first edition had two articles, one submitted by our friend Harvey Silverman, who is our author and editor of uh, the Beware to Barter Guide, a well-known consultant. And the other opinion piece was Scott Merchant, who's uh, the chief uh, growth officer uh, at, uh, I can't remember his, his title, but Scott's not in the title, so it doesn't matter, at uh, Club Profit. He wrote a great uh, LinkedIn article that we, we kind of parlayed over into the, uh, the opinion piece. So let's start with Harvey's article. And, uh, you know, he basically, he, Harvey has some medical issues, and he's putting out there that the, the morally right thing to do possibly here by the golf industry is to, well, for golfers, stay home. And the implication, he doesn't say it outright, is for golf courses to kind of not have play go on. That may be the morally right thing to do in order to protect those who are at risk of, of you know, spreading the disease, getting the disease, et cetera. And, uh, you know, he brings in, he weaves in a really good story about it. But, you know, um, I wonder, I, and this is my question, if Harvey was on the line, maybe we should have brought him on. But, you know, if Harvey himself, and he's a friend of mine, would he feel the same, even though he's a, he's a, he has medical issues that put him at a high risk for, for you know, he, so he's, he's being very you know, conscientious about this. If Harvey himself owned a golf course and was unsure that of the likelihood of surviving, his business surviving the situation, everything is tied up into this golf course, his livelihood, his future, his team, and he's fearful that he's not going to be able to survive this if he just decides to shut down until the pandemic is over. Would he close that shop and say, sorry, you know, we got to do the right thing here. So Don, I'm sure you've had, you felt the moral quandary of this, right? You know, so how do you, how do you walk that tightrope or do you not walk the tightrope and say, sorry, I'm falling over the side of safety and security and we'll just kind of hope and pray for the best. Well, I mean, guilty of what you said before I was that person. If that court, if our course would have closed, I'm looking in the bank. I know that payroll is 50,000 every 15 days and I've got $250,000 in the bank. And I'm like, we aren't going to make it if we close down for a couple months. 
But that being said, I didn't make the decision to stay open and do all the things I do just out of financial stability for everybody who works here at Augusta Ranch. It was also seeing the golfers who were like, please don't close. Please, can, 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 I mean, we, we like, enjoy coming out here. So to me, I, I put the other hat on and said, you know what, maybe I have an obligation to do the, everything I can to do this socially distancing and, and, and socially safe and see what we can do. Can we take these things on? You know, it's kind of like that question we just heard about, you know, what do you do phase one, phase two, phase three? Some of those things, there was none of that when we were trying to stay open here in Arizona. We just said, what is everybody else in the nation doing? Okay, we're going to put, you know, the little foam things in the, in the cups. We're going to get rid of the rakes. We're going to cover the bomb. We're going to get rid of the water. We're doing all of these things just to stay open. So once again, if Harvey was on the show right now, and, and I love Harvey, I understand where he's coming from. And not everybody continued to play golf. But I took it upon myself, not for financial reasons, although that was part of it. I'm not going to lie. But it was also like, can I stay open for these people? When I made those videos about being a park, I really felt that. I, I see it on people. I, two people played today, Jay. They came out and, and, and our starters like, so how you been? Uh, you, are you all right? You know, they're, wearing, they're wearing their facial, their cloth coverings. So, you know, we're just so happy to be here. We self-quarantined ourselves when this was going on. And this is only the second round of golf we've played, you know, and we played here twice in the last week. And we're just so happy to be outside. And so I know then that this was right to stay open. Now, this is my neck of the woods. In other areas of the United States, the numbers were much more scary. And so you have to do what you have to do. And in defense of Harvey, when he wrote this article, there was really scary things going on. Numbers were climbing quickly. But I, yeah, I, I would say that, um, no, I don't think I'm the bad guy. I don't think I faced some moral decision other than, okay, what's, why did I get in the industry in the first place? It was for people to enjoy playing golf with their friends and family. And can I steward that through this right. tough time? And I, you know, you know, I, I think I'll we say did the best we could. Part of you know, the article also, though, was it was more about the golfers, certainly, than the golf courses. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, if every golfer had decided to stay home, certainly then there would be no golf going on, right? If, that, if, they, if they chose that one. But, but he did, he did uh, point to the fact that there, he was witnessing in social media and himself, probably because Harvey's a golfer, uh, you may have seen some of this, uh, you know, just seeing uh, the operators being loose with allowing, you know, folks to not be socially distant and, and not have single rider golf cars. We've talked a little bit about this. There can be some perceptions that you don't know that those two people riding the same car are not living together or what have you. But, but you know, I, I can understand Harvey's fear on this because of the image of it. We're already, the image of golf is already your privileged. Uh, and now, so now here we have the privileged class out there playing golf while everybody else is suffering and so forth. That, that juxtaposition is a strong one that I know we try to avoid those kinds of images out there in the media for the industry because we, we will one, we know it's not necessarily true in most places around the country, but, but no, so yeah, so to Harvey's credit, it was more about the golfers than it was about the golf course operators. But if every golfer took his, it took, you know, the morally, if the moral choice was to stay home, then the golf courses would not be in operations. And so a tough, tough situation, but you know what? This is gonna be, there's gonna be a lot of, there's gonna be a lot of content for philosophy professors after this is all going on, you know, as far as the moral thing to do with what's happening. So those college kids that are gonna be in, in uh, uh, philosophy class this next semester, they're gonna have some interesting discussions uh, for sure, but. Um, yeah, they're gonna, they're gonna be diving into this. You know, one thing I'd like to say on that, Jay, is you know, the PJ's got a code of ethics. And if you don't follow the code of exit as a PJ member, you will get kicked out of the PJ of America because we don't want you if you're not going to follow the code of ethics, which we follow. So I, I really like that aspect. Anybody can run a golf course and, and, you know, and, and we've got some amazing NGC owners who run golf courses. And I tell them all the time about PJ members. Listen, a PJ member says he's going to do this. He has to do it. He has to abide by his word. He can't talk negatively about other people. If he says I'm going to wash the carts, he can't just say that and not do it. That's literally could be a code of ethics violation. That's the standard in which a PGA member is held to. And not to tout the PGA. I mean, I, I know this NGCOA show, and you know I love both organizations, Jay. But I do think there's something to that. If a PGA member says, I will do these things that I'm asked to do to make sure this course is safe, they have to do it. Yeah. Or they're in jeopardy of losing their membership. And I like that. That holds people to another standard. And that's the way it should be in this industry. Excellent. Let's get to uh, Scott Merchant's article. So, uh, you know, we all know and love Scott. He's a passionate guy. He's been in the industry a long, long time. And he wrote this great piece kind of saying, look, this could be golf's golden moment in the sense of this black swan event of, of COVID-19, this, this unpredictable, you know, situation. Now you have this moment where most of the other entertainment options are shut down. 
right? And that was always one of the reasons that, you know, one of the evolutions of golf in the past 20 years is like, oh no, there's, you know, 20 times the competition as far as events to choose from now than there were 20 years ago. So that hurts golf. Well, now, you know, it's reduced down to a few choices to, to, to spend your recreation time in dollars. Okay, all right, that's good for golf, right? Demand is high because existing golfers want to play more in this situation and new golfers are coming to the golf course, which is fantastic. So this is a, a perfect calculus uh, for a few things. Maybe we can reset the table uh, with regard to the relationship with our customers and how we market and price golf. So what I wanted to pull out in particular was Scott's kind of assertion that now is the time to charge more, you know, because one, your costs are probably going up. If you're having to uh, you know, do extra work to maintain cleanliness and, and uh, sanitation and all of these things, uh, um, certainly, if, if your cart inventory is, is, has shrunk, you know, in relation to, you know, what you can put out on the golf course because of the one person per car, or whatever, then, you know, your, your inventory, so there's higher demand for less inventory. So certainly uh, that's kind of an equation to raise pricing. Um, but, you know, he's got a point and he, you know, he said he feels like the last 20 years we've been, we've, we've, the customer has taken advantage of, of the opportunity to get low price golf in, 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 in America. And when you look at the consumer price index down over time, you know, consumer price index is basically what are people paying for household things, everything in their lives from a cup of coffee to, you know, laundry detergent and so forth. The consumer price index has gone like this. And I don't have the, I should show you a chart at some point, but it's gone like this over the last 20 years. The price of a round of golf in America has kind of gone like this, right? And barely gone like, like 20, 15 years ago, it was like $34 around. Now it's $37 around. It's not keeping up with the consumer price index by any means, which means Relatively speaking, golf is cheaper than it was 15 years ago, right? Okay, is this an opportunity to reset the table on pricing, not price gouging, but making up for lost time and maybe, you know, taking advantage of the new situation to, uh, to maybe price what we're worth? What do you think, my friend? Well, you know, I'm all about pricing and because I've seen what it's happened down at Augusta Ranch. And, and certainly in this time, you know, Sagacity Golf is – kicking out numbers left and right about this is what's happened in Arizona. It's clearly shown that, you know, because we didn't drop our rates, we did better. I, we didn't inflate our rates. We just simply kept charging what we felt was the right fee based on historical data so that we weren't just panicking into a situation where if I lower my rate by 20%, I'm going to get 20% more play, which does not happen. You're exactly right with the CPI. There's a lot of golf course say, well, we're, we're increased last year by two or 3%. Well, if CPI is three or 4%, you're going backwards. You just don't know it. And so you have to monitor what CPI is because you have to at least achieve that in your rev par or your profit percentages, or, or you are going backwards. I think, I don't think it's, you know, I, I love what Scott wrote, um, but I think a couple things in the revenue management world, you know, is willingness to pay. Some people have a willingness to pay to a certain mm -hmm. point. I don't have an Apple laptop. I don't, I, I'd like an, a MacBook. They're pretty cool. Can't afford it. So I get my PC and that's okay. Uh, that's what I want to do. It's just too much for me. I can't, I can't justify the decision. Now, Apple says, okay, that's fine. Then you don't get an Apple MacBook. They don't change the way. They're not going to lower the price to entice me because how low do they have to go? Because everybody else is going to buy the book for that. And they're already making money off that. So there's the key is certainly understand who your, who your group is and, and understand the willingness to pay. But that being said, I completely agree with him. We have been discounting to create demand. And really in this situation, it's inelastic, which means if you lower your rates, you don't get enough demand to offset that. So you need to price accordingly and price based on demand. That is the answer in my opinion. The other things in this piece about getting customer data, absolutely. Dealing with the third party providers to make sure that it's a mutualistic relationship. Yeah, let's talk about that absolutely. real quick. You know, on the yeah. third party question, what Scott's saying is, look, people feel the need to work with a third party, you know, what we call the online tea time agencies because demand isn't what it used to be. Like, I, you know, demand is not high in the macro sense. So we need this help to stimulate demand. Obviously, you know, you've heard me say, I'm not convinced that they stimulate demand, but except that they just, they're there to meet demand and help them book it. But, okay, so, but the feeling is, ah, yes, I could use their help because demand isn't, I've got soft times all over the T-sheet and whatever it might be. So that, that's, that's the, uh, the pull there, right? So, and what Scott is saying is, you don't, you know, if, if you're pricing strong and demand's high, what do you need them for, right, in that sense? So that's definitely something to think about. But, you know, on the customer data question, he's saying, look, now is the time, more important than ever, to collect customer data. 
And I'm going to make the case that he doesn't make this case in his uh, article, but why is that more important right now? What's changed about COVID-19 and the golf industry and why now it's more important to collect data than it was before? Because we know it's always been important to collect data, but why more important now? I, you know, I worked in the lodging industry for 10 years and I could see, you know, there were war stories there about when hotels and inns would sign up to use Expedia. You know, they put their inventory up there on Expedia and they'd get guests coming to them from Expedia and the guests would show up and they, you know, the, they didn't know that, oh, here, you know, let's say they showed up to, at a small inn. They didn't know that check-in hours were between three and, and nine. They show up at 11. Well, I didn't know, I booked on Expedia. So a lot gets lost in the translation when someone is standing between you and your customer. And right now with COVID-19 happening, there's so much you wanna to communicate to your customer that directly to them, you know, we're talking about the standards, the rules, uh, you know, whatever it is going on at, at, you know, Augusta Ranch, you wanna be able to be the one that communicates that to your customer through to your email database, your social media following and so forth. If you're relying on a third party to do that, are they getting all the information out there, right? And so um, I, I think now more than ever, you wanna have that direct relationship with your, with your customer because of the communication necessity of what's happening, what's changing, you know, six months from now, there may be some of these relaxed rules. You want to be able to communicate that with, with your customer directly. So, you know, that, to me, that that's probably puts an exclamation point on the customer relationship. What do you think? Absolutely about relationship. I mean, are you ever going to get monogamous with your customers? No, because courses that people tend to play three to five courses. That's okay but you have to build a relationship. Once it becomes about price and you commoditize your product like a gallon of gas, uh, then you're in trouble because people are gonna shop for the lowest price. And really you've changed what golf is about. Golf is about relationships. I think the key is what he's talking about is build a relationship with your consumer, build a relationship with your guests and maybe they play you more often than the other people that they're playing because at the end of the day, don't we want the relationship they have with the golfer not completely built on price? Certainly, I, once again, I can price myself out of that person. But will they pay two more dollars, you know, because they just like Augusta Ranch. You're a little more friendly over there. Isn't there a restaurant you go to that's a little more expensive? You drive a little farther to just because you like the people and the food's good and you like the way you're treated and you know it's a little more expensive. Golf needs to embrace that concept. Don't commoditize. Commoditize the times you cannot sell so that you can convert those into loyal golfers. But the times you can sell, establish that relationship. And anybody who tries to get in the middle of that, could be doing it for the wrong reasons. They might be trying to steal that person from you to direct them to other people who are giving them a bigger cut. These are the things we have to fear. When it comes to Uber and DoorDash and all those different companies that are delivering food, there's so much competition in that marketplace. I'm not that concerned that pretty soon Uber or those places are gonna say, well, you know what, I'm gonna put your restaurant on top of the list if you give me a little bit more of the take. Because that's what's going to, ha well, that's what happened in golf. There was only really one player in the market and they started working us against each other. They played our fears against each other of not having a full tee sheet. I agree with Scott, that marketplace has changed. Let's have one-to-one -one relationships with our customers. Let's not focus on price, but on feeling. And I think that we can outlive this and pretty soon more than 8% of the population will play golf because they understand 10,000 steps and 2,000 calories. Yeah, you know, and also uh, one of the variables in the equation of, of price and elasticity and golf that people forget about is time, right? I mean, oftentimes someone that plays golf has, they know I can only play one round a, you know, a week or what have you. And so, um, but now people, and Scott points this in his article, people may have more time to play, right? And so, and demand's high, more time to play. So get out there and harvest your list and market the great experience of your course, get them coming out uh, because you know the availability right now may go away eight in eight months from now, but you want them to get the bug. You want them to get that you know bit by the golf bug. So you know I say take advantage. That's that's kind of a sounds like a pejorative you know phrase, but but take advantage of the situation right now and and you know build those relationships, offer a great product, and charge what you can you know for that product. So um, so we're at the 3:45 mark here, Don. I want to finish out with one thing, just a kind of a a little bit of a PSA for a program that we support is Women's Golf Day. You know, we, uh, and, and great program that has been going on now for a number of years. They're gonna have a, a virtual celebration now on June 2nd for Women's Golf Day with the in-person uh, event uh, rescheduled for September 1st. I encourage everybody to go to womensgolfday.com to sign up as a, a facility. And there are two things they're asking for right now. One is a raising funds for Doctors Without Borders. And they're asking golf courses around the country that can 
um, donate experiences to be auctioned off. They have a, a, you know, the online auction tool to be able to do that. So if you can, can make a donation to that, great. Uh, also, they're looking for great social media contact with videos. So if you got some videos that you think would be wonderful to share through the Women's Golf Day uh, network, uh, please do so. Everybody go to womensgolfday.com to check that out. They get you know, tens of millions of impressions uh, through that program. So uh, we encourage you to, to check that out. Uh, so any, let's see, any last minute questions that we can answer before we get off the line here? Um, Don, I'm going to leave one more for you here. It has to do with, uh, we're experiencing the many challenges that come with providing single use cards, limited inventory, revenue, wear and tear. Interested in any opinions on when a good time is to uh, start relaxing the rules on golf cars while being responsible as an operator? Are you seeing anything out there or hearing anything on the golf car question? We usually bring it up just about every week. You know, we're on the front edges of this because we're, we're, we're ever, we never closed, right? So I'm certainly seeing they opened up restaurants, 10 people can eat together, and some people still want their own cart, right? And I see them in the restaurant eating together. So I, you know, what I'm thinking about, <laughs> I don't know if I'm doing, yeah, it's crazy. But I think it's, it's in this market, it's time to maybe just go to walking rates and carts are add-ons. And if you want your own cart, it's one price. If you want, if you're sharing with somebody, it's another price. I believe I'm going to go to that June one is what I'm just thinking what I'm going to do um, because I'm seeing 60 people on the tee sheet and I'm giving away 60 golf cars. And then they're all sitting in the restaurant eating together in groups of 10. And I'm like, what is going on? And so there is, it's going to give. And I think here at Augusta Ranch, it's going to give right around the first of June. Okay. Well, guys, that's all we have time for today. There were a couple of lingering questions. We'll do our best to get you some answers. Some of them were technical questions about the, the law coming up. So uh, thank you for joining us this week. We really appreciate it. And then, you know what? Friday next week, 3 p.m. is the plan. And on Tuesday, just for everybody to know, we've got Congressman Joe Cunningham joining us in a special Golf Business Live to, uh, to hear directly from Congress and to talk directly to Congress about what we're seeing out there uh, with the pandemic and what we need as businesses to, to stay alive and, to, and to, to come out the other side. So Don, as always, thank you for joining me and uh, everybody at home, stay safe and keep your head above water and keep doing a great job. Take care, everyone. Have a good week.